Hi, this is Kevin Mitke from the Sayusla Public Library, and I want to welcome you to the first ever online version of Best Books. You may have come to the Best Books program I gave back in February, and you want to hear the list again, or perhaps you were unable to attend that program. So this is your chance. Now, I'll be breaking the Best Books presentation into several parts. I'll discuss about 12 books per video, so if all goes well, there will be about 5 videos. You can find a PDF of the list of books discussed on the library's website at www.sayuslalibrary.info. That's I-N-F-O at the end. The books being discussed here have been suggested by patrons, volunteers, staff, and book critics. These include award winners and all those best of book lists that appear at the end of the year. I have not read all of these books. But this year, I think I've read about 30%, which is more than usual. Now, I may not be doing justice to a book if I haven't read it, so if it seems at all of interest to you, please take a chance and try it. Many times I've read a book after I've done this program, only to discover I could have described it a lot better if I had read it first. The books range from literary fiction to nonfiction to romance to fantasy, and hopefully you'll find something in this list that will interest you. This is not an all-inclusive list. There are books and authors I've left out, such as perennial favorite mystery author Louise Penny, really in order to give room to some lesser-known authors that you might not know about. Many of these books are available through library to go Overdrive, which you can again access through our website. Please note that while most of the fiction is available, a number of the nonfiction titles are not. I have indicated on the PDF list which books are not available through library to go. Okay, with all of that, I think we are ready to start. Um, this is the first time we've attempted to do it this way, so please be patient and bear with us. Hopefully this process will work. Okay, so I always like to start the presentation um, talking about Nancy Pearl's Rule of 50. Now, Nancy Pearl was a librarian at the Seattle Public Library, and she was the director of the Northwest Center for the Book, and she is the author of a numerous bunch of books about books called Book Lust. And she's done podcasts and TV shows and all kinds of great stuff. Well, Nancy said there are too many great books in this world, and we don't have enough time. So she said, Give yourself the first 50 pages of a book. And if it doesn't do it for you, move on. Well, then somebody said, okay, you know, I'm 80 years old and um, I'm currently running out of time. So Nancy added the caveat, for every year that you're over the age of 50, subtract one more page. Because again, life is too short. There's too many great books to read. Okay, so... This first video, we're going to be talking about fiction, and we're going to be looking at the first 12 books on the fiction list. And we're going to start with some trivia. Do you happen to know which book sold the most copies in the decade 2010 to 2019? I bet you don't. It is Fifty Shades of Grey. Who would have thought? 15.2 million copies sold. Now, I will tell you that in 2019, um, I believe the book that sold the most copies was Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. And I think the year before that, in 2018, it was Michelle Obama's memoir. But for the decade, Fifty Shades of Grey holds the title. Okay, let's get started. The first book on our list is The Testaments by Margaret Atwood. This is the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, and um, Atwood's book won the Booker Prize for 2019 um, in a tie with another author, which actually was against the Booker Prize's rules. Um, Atwood herself really wasn't supportive of having won the prize. Um, I'm sure she thought she wrote a great book, but um, she really thought the prize should go to her, totally go to her co-winner, and we'll be talking about that book just a little bit later here. As I said, this is the um, sequel to The Handmaid's Tale. This book takes place 15 years after that first book. The theocratic Republic of Gilead maintains its grip, but there are signs it's beginning to rot from within. 
At this crucial moment, the lives of three radically different women converge with potentially explosive results. If you like The Handmaid's Tale and the theme of kind of feminist, um, post-apocalyptic or dystopian future, another author you might want to look at is Meg Ellison, who has written a series which starts with the book of the unnamed midwife. Um, we do have that in the library. I do not know offhand if it's on library to go as an ebook or as a Okay, our next book is Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. Now there are three literary fantasy novels that I'm going to be talking about here in Best Books. This is the first one. Um, this one is probably the darkest. Um, it won the Goodreads Choice Awards for Fantasy. This deals with the secret societies at Yale. You're probably familiar with groups such as um, Skull and Bones and all those other secret clubs. Well, in this book, each one of those societies practices a different kind of magic. Um, and the ninth house is responsible for monitoring their magic to make sure it's controlled and it doesn't get released into the community. This young woman from the streets of LA, Galaxy Stern, um, is offered free tuition to Yale if she will join ninth house and learn to be one of these people who monitor the other houses. Um, and that's because she can see dead people, which is kind of a rare skill, even in this magical world. Pretty soon, a townie is murdered on campus, her mentor trainer goes missing, and the hunt is on for the mysterious controller of all the bad magic on campus. Kirkus, which is a um, um, really um, kind of highfalutin um, review journal, says, with an aura of both enchantment and authenticity, Bardugo's compulsively readable novel leaves a portal ajar for equally dazzling sequels. Now, I have to say, Kirkus, being a little highbrow, really doesn't like a lot of things. And so if you get a good review from Kirkus, um, that's actually very high praise. Okay, our next book is Here and Now and Then by Mike Chen. Stranded in San Francisco since the 1990s after a botched time mission, Ken has kept his past hidden from everyone around him, despite the increasing blackouts and memory loss affecting his time traveler's brain. Then, one afternoon, his rescue team arrives, 18 years too late. Their mission, return Ken to 2142, where he's only been gone weeks, not years. Torn between two lives and a family in the future, Ken is desperate for a way to stay connected to both. If you enjoy science fiction and if you enjoy time travel, I think you'll enjoy this new book by Mike Chin. The next book, Trust Exercise by Ch Susan Choi, won the National Book Award this year. Falling in love while attending a competitive 1980s performing arts high school, David and Sarah rise through the ranks before the realities of their family dynamics and economic statuses trigger a spiral that impacts their adult lives. Another book which I did not put on the list this year but is kind of similar and got kind of similar rave reviews was Normal People by Sally Rooney. And I know both of these books are available um, through Library to Go, um, and they should be pretty easy to find. Very popular um, literary fiction novels of 2019. The Water Dancer by Ta Nahisi Coates. A Virginia slave narrowly escapes a drowning death through the intervention of a mysterious force that compels his escape and personal underground war against slavery. Booklow says, this is beautifully written, a deeply and soulfully imagined look at slavery and human aspirations. Library Journal reports, Coates cites Toni Morrison and E.L. Doctorow as huge influences in writing this book, and the scope and seriousness on display here would make them both proud. If you read Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, um, I think you might very well enjoy The Water Dancer. Recursion by Blake Crouch won the Science Fiction Goodreads Choice Awards this year. New York City cop Barry Sutton investigates the devastating phenomenon, the media dubbed false memory syndrome, a mysterious affliction that drives its victims mad with memories of a life they never lived. Neuroscientist Helen Smith dedicated her life to creating a technology 
that will let us preserve our most precious moments of our past. If she succeeds, anyone will be able to re-experience a first kiss, the birth of a child, or the final moment with a dying parent. An opponent of both seeks to use the technology to rule the world, and both work together to try to stop it. The Butterfly Girl by Renee Denfeld is a sequel to her earlier book, The Child Finder, which was a best book a couple of years ago. In Denfeld's second Naomi Cottle novel, the investigator is deeply obsessed by a mystery embedded in The Child Finder, that of her own missing sister whom Naomi hasn't seen since escaping captivity as a child, and can scarcely remember. Putting up signs in Portland Skid Row, Naomi meets 12-year-old Celia and her group of fellow street kids. Celia, abused by her stepfather and then by the legal system that refused to believe her, conjures butterflies to help in her hardest moments, and is initially wary of outsider Naomi. Now, some readers have found this harder than The Child Finder. The Child Finder had a little bit more of a fantasies sense to it. Um, the Butterfly Girl is pretty gritty. It does take place on the streets of Portland with homeless, abused kids and who is helping them and who is trying to take advantage of them. It's a very powerful book. Um, if you liked The Child Finder, I would totally recommend reading The Butterfly Girl, but you will find that it is a different type of a book. Okay, some of you may have read Room. Um, by Emma Donahue. It was made into a movie. It was about a young woman who is held captive um, in a shack out behind some man's house, and she bears the man a child. And it's a pretty, um, pretty sad, gritty book. Um, Akin, her latest book, is quite different. On the cusp of his 80th birthday, widowed and retired professor Noah Salvaggio is preparing to visit his native niece. Thinly disguised as a vacation, the trip is actually an opportunity for Noah to explore his roots. He wants to learn more about his mother. What role did she have in the Marcel Network that rescued more than 500 children from the Nazis before leaving France for America? On the eve of his departure, however, Noah is saddled with a new responsibility, the care of his grandnephew, 12-year-old Michael, whose father is dead and whose mother is serving time in prison. Under Understandably, Michael complicates Noah's mission. Setting the story against the compelling backdrop of the annual Carnival de France, Donahue shines in her careful study of this slice of World War II history in France. This was the other book that won the Booker Prize, um, sharing that with um, um, The Testaments by Margaret Atwood. Kirkus describes this book. Amma is walking along the promenade, the waterway that bisects her city. A few early morning barges cruise slowly by. These are the opening lines of Evaristo's eighth novel. The unexpected line breaks, the paucity of punctuation and capitalization. These stylistic choices are, at first, disorienting, and that makes perfect thematic sense. Amma is a black woman, a lesbian, and a fiercely feminist playwright, who is gaining mainstream attention after decades of working on the margins. Each of the twelve characters Evaristo conjures here have had to work hard to make a place for themselves in a culture that regards them as outsiders, even if they've lived in the United Kingdom their entire lives. Publishers Weekly says, this is a stunning powerhouse of vibrant characters and heartbreaks. Our next book is The Lost Man by Jane Harper. This is a standalone novel, but some of you may have read some of Jane Harper's mysteries that were set in Australia. She's a New York Times best-selling author. Um, she doesn't have a large number of books out there, but some of those that she's written include The Dry and Force of Nature. Um, she, her novels are constructed around the harsher extremes of the Australian outback. In this novel, when the sun-baked body of Cam Bright, experienced at desert survival, was found by his brothers adjacent to a lone headstone in the middle of nowhere, marking the stockman's grave, they are hard-pressed to find an explanation. The answer is found only by revisiting their childhood, which was hobbled by a battered mother and flooded with terror by an abusive father. The atmosphere is so thick 
you can taste the red clay dust, and the folklore surrounding the mysterious stockman adds an additional edge to an already dark and intense narrative. The truth is revealed in a surprising ending that reveals how far someone will go to preserve a life worth living in a place at once loathed and loved. Okay, our next book is the second fantasy novel, um, literary fantasy novel that was prominent this year, The Ten Thousand Doors of January. Alex Harrow dazzles with his historical fiction fantasy hybrid about a young woman who discovers that the key to opening the door for change lies within ourselves. January Scholar is growing up at the turn of the 20th century as a ward of Mr. Locke, a wealthy collector of artifacts, while her father is in Mr. Locke's service, searching for the rarest items. Being of mixed heritage in a world not kind to those in between, January feels like a tolerated addition to Mr. Locke's collection of unique objects. But one day, a strange book appears, one that smells of leather and adventure, of secrets and love. And when January falls through that leather-bound door, her life will never be the same. The Ten Thousand Doors of January is both whimsical and smart, using engaging writing and a unique plot to touch on serious topics. Harrow's debut reads like a love letter to the art of storytelling itself, and readers will be eager for more from her. Of the three fantasy novels I'm going to talk about this, this, in this Best Books presentation, this might be considered the gentlest, so um, and probably the most straightforward. Um, try it, try it. The Ten Thousand Doors of January. I thought it was a very good book. Okay, our final and twelfth book in this video is a romance. Evie Drake starts over. A staff member wrote about this book. What a lovely, warm-hearted, generous book. I was excited and nervous to read it because I enjoy Linda Holmes so much on Pop Culture Happy Hour. And what if it didn't live up to her on-air delightfulness? But it did, and then some. Widowed Evie is a wonderfully flawed protagonist, and washed-up pitcher Dean is a great foil and a good man on his own. Watching them help each other with their respective troubles was entertaining and sometimes hilarious, and left me a weepy mess by the end of the book, but in a good way. So that concludes the first video of Best Books of 2019. I hope you got some ideas of some things to read. Um, you may have these books at home. You may be able to order them from Amazon. You may be able to get them from Library to Go. Um, I do hope that um, this has given you some good ideas. So take care, everybody. Talk to you on part two coming up.